what phase do we know what phase we are in for the pandemic i always find these sorts of uses of these kinds of phrases a little bit misleading because we are in a situation where if we look at the case data for at the moment, it's a very clear epidemic curve. We are in a situation where cases are falling. If you think about classically what we mean when we think about an endemic phase is you have a disease that's sort of circulating in a population at a very, very low level. And then occasionally we could say this with, say, things like seasonal influenza, which circulates sort of most of the year. But then when it comes to the winter, you get epidemic. You get spikes of cases that increase and go down again. Sometimes this happens that you would call something maybe endemic if it circulates in the population at a low level. And then occasionally you get epidemics kind of spurting out. In terms of COVID-19, I would very clearly say we're not in what we would call an endemic phase as such. We are still in an epidemic. Science. Science. Technology. Technology. Medicine. Medicine. Health. Health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast. A weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. Answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes. A tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimi Abraham. Welcome back to Monday Science. Uh, today we have a returning guest, Professor Mike Tiddlesley. How are you today? Not too bad, thank you. How are you? Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Remind us a little bit um, about yourself and, and what you do. So, okay, so I'm, I'm a professor of infectious disease modelling at the University of Warwick, and I guess I, along with quite a lot of epidemiologists over the last couple of years, have been doing work to analyse the spread of um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 infection, and thinking a little bit about the effectiveness of different types of intervention policy um, and trying to forecast forward how the virus might spread. So I, re I guess we've been kind of working with policy for the last couple of years and trying to inform them regarding this potential spread of disease and what the impact various different intervention policies might have. Amazing. So we had you on as a guest. It was January 2021. And it was amazing because it was part of our sort of trying to understand COVID series and your expertise in infectious disease modeling. It was really, really of, of importance and, and value to our, our general understanding. It's interesting to have this conversation with you a year, a year and a bit later and seeing how far things have gone with COVID and, and everything. But that's generally what we're just going to have a quick chat about, really. I remember because I was listening again to the episode recently i remember that you said that your interest as you i think you've already highlighted that is understanding the disease in real time so understanding understanding like the spread of a disease in real time so what what have been like the key learning points for you in this area as it relates to SARS-CoV-2 over the last year i'll say or any update from what you've understood about the virus in the last year <laughs> Well, I think, of course, the, the challenge that we do need to remember is that any kind of sort of real time modelling, there is an awful lot of uncertainty attached to this. And we can see this. There have been various points throughout the last sort of 12 months where there's been a lot of uncertainty regarding what might happen. There's a couple of key points that we can highlight since last time we spoke. So we had the Delta variant emerging in the UK over the summer. And then, of course, we had the Omicron variant emerging towards the end of 2021. Now, of course, when you... Um, you can get early ideas that there's something going on by seeing what's happening in the data. There might be particular parts of the country where cases are growing much faster, or it may be that for whatever reason, you might see that maybe the vaccines might look like they're being a little bit less effective. Um, and when those sorts of things happen in the data, you can get early signs of, well, there might be something going on. And then, of course, you know, if you get genomic analysis you can get okay, you can get information that suggests okay we have a new variant that's circulating now when that happens of course what policymakers need is very rapid sort of advice in terms of how rapidly do we think this is going to spread 
how well do we think the vaccines are going to hold up and what might be the role of interventions but of course there's a lot of uncertainty around this now this thing puts us sometimes in a bit of a catch-22 that you can say well okay we have uncertainty so we can't say with high levels of confidence what might happen but of course the problem is you can't afford to wait for two to three weeks before you absolutely 100% know what's going to happen because at that point it might be too late to make a decision. So this is where it becomes really complex and what we have to do as modelers is carry out a series of scenarios and say well if we think for example and this is very much trivializing the situation but let's say for example we have a new variant that emerges and we know that the severity is anything from the same severity as the previous variant to maybe twice as severe. And um, then what you have to do is you have to carry out scenarios which cover that entire range of possibilities. And then once you've done that, you can then put that forward to policy and say, well, if it's as severe, then this is what we expect. If it's twice as severe, then this is what we expect. And here are all the range of scenarios in the middle. Now, of course, crucially, um, none of the modelers are decision makers. We are just really tasked to carry out these scenarios. And then it's up to policy to untangle all of these and take into account you know, any kind of economic implications, any implications based on people's behavior and so forth for them to make a decision. But the key thing that we need to do is try to get those uncertainties into our forecast. And that is very, very complex. We are always operating with a lot of uncertainty. And of course, it's very easy actually two weeks later to look back at these models and say, well, these forecasts weren't quite right, but we now have more information. So at the time that the forecasts were done, they were done based on the best information Two weeks later, you might have better information and your forecast might change. So these are some of the challenges that I think we have to deal with when we're modelling in real time. Amazing. And so now we've got so many different variants in the community. I was thinking, how do you model for all the variants in one go in a given community? And do you have to just prioritise what the main variant is and look and say, OK, well, in the UK, if let's say Omicron is the uh, most common uh, variant, then you model mainly for Omicron, or do you have the outlayers for Delta, Alpha, whoever else is still <laughs> in the mix? Um, and then, because I, I, when we spoke last time, we talked about people who are asymptomatic. So how does that all come in together to give you a picture of predictions as it relates to, as we all, the pandemic, Corona, but actually we know that Corona is broken up into many different variants. And then also, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it has different viral load, different transmission rates and things like that. So yeah, like how does that all work? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is, I mean, obviously it's impossible to model every single variant or subvariant that may be circulating in the population. And of course, if we take this down to the individual level, every single individual who gets infected, regardless of the variant, will have slightly different symptoms, sometimes very subtly, but will be maybe infected for a slightly different period of time. And it's impossible in a model to model all of those things absolutely individually. But what you have to do, therefore, is you have to try to capture what might go on at the population level. So what we can do in the models, of course, is we can model, say, Delta and Omicron co-circulating, which is what they're still doing to some extent at the moment. And of course, they have slightly different characteristics. So you might have a model that considers Delta infections and also considers Omicron infections. And of course, they have different severities attached to them. The vaccines are slightly different levels of effectiveness against both these variants. And of course, they're slightly different in terms of how transmissible they are. So you can build those into the model frameworks. And of course, that then affects the outcomes because, and this is particularly important when a new variant emerges. If a new variant emerges, then you need to have a model that can model both variants circulating at the same time. Over a longer term, it may be that one of those variants becomes dominant. And of course, we saw this with Delta over Alpha, that over a period of time, Delta became dominant over Alpha. But it's very important, actually, to consider that period of time where one is not necessarily dominant over the other, because, of course, then that really influences what happens on the population level. Because I said both because of how transmissible they are, but also because of how effective the vaccines might be. So it's really important that you build those into the model framework. Of course, there have to be approximations made, because as I said, you can't model right down to the level of the individual and how they are personally affected. 
but when you're thinking about national scale predictions and national scale impacts of intervention policies or so forth, these approximations need to be made so that you can provide advice on that national scale. And so we talk about the pandemic and I, I was reading some of the people saying, oh, we're in the epidemic or endemic phase. What phase, do we know what phase we are in for the pandemic? Yeah, and I, I, I always find these sorts of uses of these kinds of phrases a little bit misleading because we are in a situation where if we look at the case data for at the moment, it's a very clear epidemic curve. I mean, we are in a situation where cases are falling but really what, if you think about kind of classically what we mean when we think about an endemic phase is you have a disease that's sort of circulating in a population at a very, very low level. But, um, and then occasionally, I mean, we could say this with say things like seasonal influenza, which circulates sort of most of the year, but then when it comes to the winter, you get you get epidemics, you get spikes of cases that increase and go down again. Sometimes this happens that you would call something maybe endemic if it circulates in the population at a low level, and then occasionally you get epidemics kind of spurting out. In terms of um, COVID-19, I would very clearly say we're not in what we would call an endemic phase as such. We are still in an epidemic. It may be the tail end of an epidemic, but of course, what we don't yet know is what will happen over the next six months. Will we see, and I very much hope we don't, but will we see another variant emerging that has a transmission advantage again and you get another epidemic wave? And um, if you do, of course, what are the implications of that? If it's a less severe variant, then it may be that you get another epidemic wave, but you don't get a, a wave of hospital emissions along with that because you are not getting as severe symptoms. But of course, these are all ifs, buts and maybes. We don't yet know what might happen over the next next six months in terms of any new variants that might come along, what will be the characteristics of those, and what will happen with the vaccination programme. Are we going to have repeated vaccination campaigns for the vulnerable so that we can protect them in similar ways to what we do with flu every winter? And when you, the six month time period, is there a reason for that? Is that how long it takes for a new variant to pop up? Or are you just saying six months is a arbitrary value well i yeah i mean i'm I think clinging we, on you know, to your words mike i'm clinging <laughs> uh, we i think we have to say the if we've learned one thing from the last couple of years that this virus is not predictable so we cannot say that every six months we will get a new variant new variants do emerge all the time and and you get small mutations regularly when you know variant passes from one individual to another now a lot of those variants are no different really from any other variant that might be circulating but sometimes you get variants emerging that have a lot of mutations and have quite a lot of different characteristics it's very hard to predict when they might happen but of course when they do happen that's when you are concerned and you need to monitor what's going to go on and to try to determine what effect that will have upon the number of cases in the population. You've been listening to the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. We hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show, and we hope you had fun along the way. We know we did. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on our website at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com. Shoot us an email at info at mondaysciencepodcast.com. Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science. And access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.